All right. I have been working on this for the past four or five or six days, and it is something that I want to and am compelled to and need to share. I am not going to say everything right. As a perfectionist, that's difficult for me. <laughs> but that inescapable reality has kept me from saying anything at all for so much of my life in relation to so many different things. But here it's about one thing. And in and so I'm just going to do my best. And uh, here at the start, in order to provide some context for what follows, I, I need to interject a brief clip of a 1966 documentary titled A Time for Burning because that is where my heart broke, at least in part. And so here it is. The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. Well, this is the big, I agree with you uh, perfectly. This is the basic problem. Then what do you that white people uh, think they're better than that I can others? Do? I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings at closed schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years, and we're tired of this kind of stuff now. We're not going to suffer patiently anymore. No more turning the other cheek. No more blessing our enemies. No more praying for those who despitefully use us. We're going to show you that we've learned the lessons you've taught us. We've studied your history, and you did not take over this country by singing we shall overcome you did not gain control of the world like you have it now by dealing fairly with a man and keeping your word your treaty breakers your liars your thieves you rape entire continents and races of people then you wonder why these very people don't have any confidence or trust in you your religion means nothing your law is a farce and we see it every day you demonstrated it in alabama and i can say you because you're part of the whole system you profit from it in fact you make your living from it you couldn't walk around and talk to people, stand up in your pulpit on Sunday and preach nice little songs and say, now we're going to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and old Jesus be among us. As far as we're concerned, your Jesus is contaminated, just like everything else you've tried to force upon us is contaminated. Mm -hmm. On June 17th, 2015, Dylan Roof shot and killed nine black men and women in Charleston, South Carolina, in what is now known as the Charleston Church Massacre. The next day, I wrote out and published a prayer online because that <laughs> is what I do in an attempt to stand with others in some form of solidarity and in that prayer, I confessed my ignorance of the long-standing and deep-rooted issues that were related to fueling that tragedy, let alone the injustices before it, which have left me, what I wrote was, at best, feeling completely inadequate to speak anything into them and, at worst, condemned and afraid. I remember a year later, on the 4th of July, I was, uh, I was driving with my wife through Muncie, Indiana. We had just left a music festival and were headed to an Independence Day barbecue. 
with some friends when Lecrae uh, tweeted out an image of seven black Americans picking cotton in a field accompanied by the caption, my family on the 4th of July, 1776. <laughs> the explosion that that tweet was. Like I followed the aftermath, the aftermath of his un-American post very closely. And I watched as vitriol compounded upon vitriol, how anti-patriotic of him Every false dichotomy between race and gospel. Why do you have to do that today? We're supposed to be celebrating. And that was the start of a lot of things for me. I remember, I, I, I remembered Eric Garner and Michael Brown's death, which happened back to back in the summer of 2014, two years prior, and Trayvon Martin's two years prior to that. And I empathized with the men that I followed online, and I was as heartbroken as I could be, but it was a far-removed reality that was very <laughs> far removed from mine, and I didn't know how to lend a voice, and I tried to listen, but I don't know how hard I tried to learn. And the not knowing how hard I tried is telling enough. I now understand that that is called apathy and it blinds you to the suffering of others in favor of your own comfort. Two days after Lecrae posted that picture, Philando Castile was shot and killed. I was driving home from tour at that point. I stopped in Joplin, Missouri and spent the night and saw the video and And um 2 months later, Terrence Crutcher was murdered. And I didn't know about Freddie Gray before that who was killed for possessing a knife. I didn't know about John Crawford, who was shot in Walmart for holding a BB gun. I didn't know about Amado Diallo's murder, who was shot 19 times with a semi-automatic rifle for pulling a wallet out of his back pocket. I didn't know about Walter Scott's murder. <laughs> After being stopped at a traffic light because his brake light was out. I didn't know about Corey Jones' murder, who was shot six times standing next to his disabled vehicle. I didn't know about Keith Lamont Scott, who was the wrong man and the wrong married man with seven children. Fruitvale Station told me about Oscar Grant, and by that I mean the movie. A couple years ago, not the actual incident. Nowhere near my radar. And if I'm telling the truth, I didn't know many of these people's names, and that list is far from exhaustive until this weekend, when my heart broke, like so many other people's, nine minutes. And I am broken at the realization that I have been and no longer want to be included among and this quote, uh, this quote comes from a guy named Charles Morgan Jr. following the 16th Street Baptist Church bombings almost 40 years ago. 
included among all of the Christians and all of their ministers who spoke too late in anguished cries against violence. I have acknowledged and bickered with others about the existence of white supremacy and systemic racism for years. I am a naturally empathetic person. I feel the heartbreak of others very quickly and very deeply, and I cry a lot. (laughs) And I have not been able to stop crying this weekend. (laughs) But while I have wanted to be present with people and for people, I also acknowledge that I've never truly experienced the crushing awareness of my own sin in relation to the truths that I gave assent to. <laughs> Among the black men and women that I follow, who I follow, some are, and some are friends and, or acquaintances that I know personally, and some are simply people whose voices I trust. I hear pleas that are equal parts shut up and listen and amplify black voices and white people. It is not our job. It is not the job of the oppressed to educate the oppressor. You do it. And I've heard those things for a long time. And whether for fear of my idols or my own imperfections and inadequacies or perfectionism, expressed as far back as five years ago during those Charleston bombings, shootings, sorry, or, or, the, or the fact that I didn't pry my eyelids open to see what was happening in order to give full vent to something what, like what this might be. I, I have not, here's the thing, I have not risked the awkward and inevitable incompleteness of being a white man who really shares his conviction in a definitive or educated way. It, the, it is awkwardly and inevitably incomplete, but I am trying. Now, sometimes I'm not sure what action looks like. I see that from a lot of people. But to be clear, for me, that is another confession that is rooted in willful ignorance and not a justification. Following the last couple days' worth of tears shed, I am convicted that at the very least, action for me entails the opening of my mouth to speak words that might land on a listening audience that, by some weird miracle, I have as some form, some form of public figure. So I am just going to try to express my heart to my people, not as the lofty, not from a pedestal or a high horse. I have no business there, but as the learner. And it is also based upon personal perspective and experience which I hope that you can keep in mind, whoever watches this, everything on the internet feels like an attack. Social media in particular has become something against which people brace themselves so forcefully that they feel as though every statement shared, no matter what it is, is intended to be a specific attack against you in particular. That's not what this is. (laughs) This is a confession And we have got to get out of that mind frame if we are ever going to do anything other than argue and take offense at one another's expression. Please. So first of all, as clearly and succinctly as I can say it, I stand in solidarity with the black community and against social injustice and systemic racism that stands to tear it down. Black lives matter unequivocally without any caveats, buts, or alsos. And I recognize that I have been a part of it. And anticipating 
the inevitable all lives matter response. Um, there's been a quote floating around on the internet lately that says saying all lives matter as a response to saying black lives matter is like saying that the fire department should spray down all houses in a neighborhood, even though only one house is on fire because all houses matter. Yes, your house matters too, but your house is not on fire. That, that much established, I can only speak from my own experience and context. Mine is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which does come with the realization that as a white New Mexican, <laughs> in what is not primarily a black and white racial divide, but a Native American one, and with two best friends from Zia and Gallup, I am constantly aware that any time I speak on behalf of the brutalized in this conversation, it is simultaneously applicable there. And I have a hell of a long way to go in both cases. Nevertheless, today, I am talking about this specific statement. Black lives matter. And I do think that it's fair to say that even though that I, I've called Albuquerque home for a long time, a huge portion of the past 10 years of my life as a touring artist have been lived outside of it. And I, I, and I am not the same man that I think that I would be had I not lived inside of a car for a decade, experiencing life outside of this culture. And because of that reality, at least <laughs> according to my mom, who I am so thankful to be able to have these conversations with, I have often found myself at political and social and theological odds with many of the people who are closest to me here. And on the one hand, that's beautiful because I'd be an arrogant bastard. And trust me, I can be an arrogant bastard to write something like this, hoping that others will listen without listening back myself. So this is my world. And if we are going to talk in generalities, then I tend to lean more toward left and liberal in all three categories. And it, while, the, while many of my friends and family don't. That said, before I go any further, I am not a fan of sweeping blanket statements and the absurdity and repugnance of even having to speak about image bearers of God in relation to anyone's ideological bent. It's nauseating. That shouldn't be a prerequisite for anything related to this conversation. Nevertheless, is it not there that we find ourselves? just stuck inside of categorical nightmares like red and blue and dark elephant and all of the baggage that they contain. And so I share my experience because I think that many people, my age, my demographic, my faith legacy in particular, can relate to both the cognitive dissonance and paralysis that comes from seeing an outworking of faith that resonates and is being discussed or acted upon elsewhere while still feeling confined to what is more generally, generally associated with a conservative narrative of orderly, order, orderly, orderly, or, orderliness God, and culture wars and what we perceive to be the dismissal of the downtrodden in our immediate context or at least as a part of the history that still holds us by a shirt collar. And that paralysis is called a great many things. Spinelessness and cowardice included. That, <laughs> that compound their guilt and quicken 
the sand that we are all already sinking in. And oftentimes it is those things, spinelessness and cowardice. But I, I have to show some grace <laughs> also based on my own experience, and I hope it can be extended toward me that about facing is also a process that doesn't seem to happen overnight. We can't understand how others can't do the things that we think that they should do, but also we cannot do them or we don't do them ourselves. And so we're just as frustrated with ourselves as with others, aware of the hypocrisy that gives way to self-loathing and a complete turning inward on oneself. Instead of taking the step and risking the trip and the fall, and for sure tripping and falling, and then taking another step. There is one thing that I want to uh, say as a caveat or attempt at avoiding brash vilification. Um, one of the dominant cries of the current moment is that Silence equals complicity, and in a very short amount of time, I have come to believe that, which is why I'm choosing to share this today. However, I think it's worth saying that for a cry that quickly turns to damnation based upon the presumption that social media statements are implicit in what it means to speak, Although it is, my, it is my conviction and choice to do so because of my place as some sort of public figure, I think it's worth saying that to speak is not necessarily the equivalent of trying to post constantly on social media. I'm not trying to make allowances for those who ignore their call to do so. But I'm also willing to bet that some of the loudest people on social media are completely devoid of actions that substantiate their retweetable camaraderie in real life. So perhaps silence does equal complicity, but I think it's fair to say that so do speaking voices exist off of the Twitter timeline. I think that that's fair. I'm writing this, I'm sharing this because I want to, without pressure and regardless of extrinsic reward or whatever, or whatever extrinsic reward or defamation might exist on the other side of this action, I simply believe that it is right and it's like a switch that was hit inside of my head that moved me from fear to action and in saying that, <laughs> I am aware here, especially that to do anything and especially to speak to power that is not rooted in deep centuries long fear is itself a privilege. This Sunday, my friend Alex Early at Redemption Church in Seattle, Washington delivered a sermon that was the final push for me to march in this weekend's protest in downtown Albuquerque. And that's a whole other story. It's on my, whatever, it's on Instagram if you want to look at that. But in short, I spent all day trying to write this thing, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm expressing to now, but I couldn't get past the loudest voice in my spirit that asked, over and over again, when are you going to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer? When are you going to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer? When are you going to do and not just hear? And so to quote Alex, he, uh, he had this section of his sermon and he said, it is the Christian response, it is the spirit-led response to look at suffering, injustice, pain, racism, and weep with those who are weeping. I know that that doesn't manifest itself in the march for everyone. 
He goes on to say that this is not an option. This is a commandment from our apostle for us to be relationally and emotionally engaged in the world in such a way that we see the suffering of other human beings and move toward them in great compassion. The gospel that does not speak to and practice and seek justice on behalf of those who are brutalized and marginalized is no gospel whatsoever in a time like this. A gospel that merely is a private, individualized, personal relationship only between the individual and God that someone does in their head only is not the gospel. He says the gospel has practical, tangible, gritty, horizontal, relational implications. Do you want to know a huge reason why so many people, maybe you, maybe your friends, maybe your kids, are leaving the church and their faith behind in droves? Do you think it's because they enjoy the way that their body aches or the anxiety or the way that they can't function out of anything other than anger, or the way that it feels like everything has completely fallen apart. Do you think that it is fun to be flipped upside down when you wake to see yourself inside of a world God, where love was only ever hypothetical? It is no wonder to me whatsoever, none, that people are calling it quits on the faith that they thought that they knew. And the response, the response is almost always, yeah, 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 his people, oh God, his people. But what if we just return to Jesus? God, Jesus is seen or not seen through people. A friend of mine wrote me the other day <clears throat> to share this quote that resonated with him. I, I'll link to it in the written version of this. The fact that you have to build a narrative for a man to be loved and given justice is repulsive. Even if he was a capital criminal, he deserved to be treated as someone created in God's image. I am done coddling Christians that can only love people if they deem them to be lovable. Who is it that Jesus said is not worthy of love? Why is it so difficult to imagine that it could have been you, your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your father's face on the pavement? Why can't you open your eyes? Why? Why can't I open my mouth? If this is inflammatory, please remember that it's also contextual, but American Christianity, the brand, has lost the tangible if it ever existed in the first place. I know our chairs are so comfortable. But for a system whose premise is built upon the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we are so unforgiving. I know that good people exist here. 
And I hope that you hear my own self included in this critique. And I know that blanket statements here are as unfair as blanket statements about all cops being racist. Please. My own sister-in-law is a police officer, and I respect her. And she's told me that she's never seen the kind of racism or police brutality being protested right now during her entire career. Good. I hope that she never does. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so blanket statements are largely unhelpful. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they don't exist for a reason. I can't, I can't imagine a worse, less honest or unforgiving world to be in than the Christian market. This is my world. I hate it. And I hate that I have to write that out. And a lot of people won't understand it, but it's true. I've straddled it for 10 years professionally and my entire life personally and it's true i'm telling you it's true music and church and books and trinkets and whatever <clears throat> it is no wonder it is not a surprise at all to me that pastors are more ready to kill themselves then they are ready to let others see who they actually are or speak up. The world that we have created is atrocious. But that reality, as devastating as it is, simply feels like a given. And I know that I'm talking about myself because there have been so many times, you know, that rather than risking what it takes to function from my convictions, I've hid in the shadows because it is there that I find the boring complacency that privilege affords me. That's why I shared the quote and the video clip at the start of all of this. I am a part of the whole system. I do profit from it. In fact, I do make my living off of it. That cut me to the heart. Do you know how many things that I have not said for fear? My friend calls that becoming the Judas. How much silver is in my pockets? Did you know that I just recently started to discover that the truth actually does set you free. So many of my friends have left. So many. It is devastating to discover that loving others comes more naturally on the outside of a system whose entire claim is to be predicated upon love incarnate. <laughs> This isn't a farewell, you know, but it's an explanation given regarding many of my and, and my peers' frustration with what is happening in the world this weekend, specifically related to faith systems or cute truisms that, that exist as little more than hyperbole and inaction and complicity. <clears throat> So, to come full circle, part of me loves that Lecrae is still a rapper to white evangelicalism, and part of me wishes that he could be free. It's such a love-hate relationship. I hate it because it feels like a prison, and I love it because I can't help not to. And for some reason, if there is a God, and I think that there is, then the one who holds my heart is named Jesus, and... His grip pisses me off sometimes, but I can't help but see him as beautiful in the midst of so much ugliness. And I didn't see him abandon everyone, no matter how many tables he had to throw over. 
But, man, he threw over tables. My world knows very little about dealing with emotion in a healthy way. Anger and rage are most often posited as sinful. And it's been like that forever. And because of our fear of expressing the truth, we devolve into flaccid, avoidant people in the name of a God who is furious. Furious. He's so angry at the blaspheming of his name through the dehumanization of children made image and likeness. There's a quote by a couple named Ron and Vicki Burke, whose book helped me very much during some very dark times. And they say that rage is exactly what happens inside when you wake up to find that you have been living inside of a lie. <laughs> I I have no interest whatsoever in continuing to submit to systems wherein I feel as though I need to lie to myself and others in order to be accepted, propped up, or paid by them. And so I wrote this novel. And if this novel means that I've lost some people or that I'm lost to you, then I'm ready to accept that reality and let the chips fall where they may. But I have lied to myself and cushioned myself in too many ways for too long, and I am done with it. I know that there are horrific things happening in the name of George Floyd. I know that people are taking his name in vain. I know that his own children have denounced it. I know that good police officers are being thrown under the bus. I know how conflicting it feels to go march in protest when so many protests devolve into riots that have put law enforcement officials like my sister-in-law in danger. I know that there are people who shouldn't be in danger who are. And as I write this, I know that it's getting worse. As I record this, I know that it's getting worse. And that's another novel in and of itself. Yesterday morning, I saw a black man trying to protect his storefront, beaten almost to death by another kid who hit him over and over and over again with his skateboard trucks. <laughs> it was the most, it was one of the most brutal things that I have ever seen in my life. I, I, like, tears poured from my body a split second after the camera neared the guy on the ground. I'll never be able to unsee that. I can't watch the George Floyd video. I don't think I should have watched Castile's Killer Mike. He called it murder porn. And it is. And things like that shouldn't have to exist for people to speak up and take action and change their minds, but they do. And to my shame, I have had to wait until now to write something like this. I repent of apathy, knowing full well that I will have to repent again. I repent of sinking into fear. It is by far my deepest, most recurring sin. I'll have to repent again. Who is my neighbor? <clears throat> I was considering something based upon a tweet that I saw yesterday and read. It had over 600 shares at the time and 8,500 likes. And it said, let me say it for the millionth time. 
Christians are the worst people you can find (laughs) for the literal love of God. Be, do, speak. Be, do, speak something different. I had the thought near the end of Alex's sermon when he was wrapping up with the Good Samaritan that perhaps in a faith tradition that has been co-opted by power and political expediency, we should listen to the words in that tweet and repent of having become so far removed from the least of these that our presence as a salve is entirely unexpected to anyone bloodied on the side of the road. Maybe, for me, doing, at least for now, means doing what I always do, which is to write and to share, and I hope that it is something. This world is ripe with opportunity for us to speak and co-suffer and lend a hand and provide a donkey and go out of our way and put our money where our mouth is and be a salve to be Christ to one another. People don't have to align with your worldview. They don't have to believe what you do. They sure as hell, don't have to look like you. You know, and thank God that they don't. These people as masterpieces, because pure white is a boring world. I know that this has been a novel. I know that this has been long, and I hope that its length has not been counterproductive given the call to listen. I am a verbal, written processor, and I am simply attempting to give voice to conviction and the things that I have been listening to and am trying to learn and feel compelled to express. Um, to conclude there's a quote uh, well not by Alex Alex said this at the end of his sermon and it's how I'd like to wrap this up as well was there was there ever a person in the Bible whose silence was redemptive? Yes. One. Jesus. Jesus, in his silence, intentionally suffered injustice, and when he rose from the grave, he had much to say. I am grateful for a weeping Jesus who can identify in this moment with us. I've included a written transcript of this video and it's got links and resources and Alex's sermon and all kinds of things attached to it. And you can find that on my website or at the link below. Thank you.